There are two main technologies to do this. One of them is the cool cap, where just the cooling device is put on the baby's head, and the other is the whole body cooling, where the baby lays on a blanket. Hello, welcome to Tala Talks NICU. In this video, we are going to be talking about the treatment of HIE, or more specifically, the cooling therapy. I would highly suggest that you go back and watch the last video on the pathophysiology of HIE as well as the diagnosis, otherwise this video won't make as much sense. As of right now, the only therapy that has been shown to be neuroprotective and like actually affect developmental outcomes for babies with HIE is hypothermic therapy or cooling therapy. So that is what we are going to be talking about today. So today we are going to go through some historical facts, which I think are kind of interesting about cooling and how we reached where we are now. Two, how cooling works. This is gonna be pretty short because nobody really knows. Then three, we'll go through which infants qualify for cooling. Four, we'll go through the cooling therapy itself and the different things that we have to monitor. And then five, we'll talk briefly about the outcomes after HIE and the hypothermic therapy. So first, let's start with some historical background. For a really long time, people have known that when you cool a body down, it is likely protective for the nervous system. In fact, as far back as the Egyptians, the Romans, the Greeks, they used cooling therapy for people that had battle-inflicted wounds, or if there was weird stuff going on with their brain or whatever, they tried cooling those patients. The brilliant Greek physician, Hippocrates, discovered that if babies were born and left out in the open, they had a much higher chance of survival if they were born in the winter as opposed to the summer. From a neonatal standpoint, all of this kind of background kind of culminated in the 1950s and 1960s, where researchers and clinicians realized that if babies had suffered some sort of HIE or were just not breathing or were stunned at birth, then by dipping them in extremely cold water, those babies had a much higher chance of survival. These studies were all promising, but then during this period, a lot of different techniques were developed to help babies res get resuscitated. So forms of active resuscitation with positive pressure ventilation and with CPAP, and just resuscitating these babies became a lot more effective. Also, it was found that if the babies were preterm or small, and they were using this technique of putting them in very cold water, then those babies actually had a higher chance of mortality. So this whole cooling thing at birth kind of got put on the back burner. Eventually, researchers got back to animal studies. And in those animal studies, especially in lambs, they realized that if those infants were cooled during a certain period of time, then it definitely helped the neurological outcomes. Like all neonatal studies, then after the animals, more studies were done in the neonates. And kind of by the early 2000s, there were a lot of preliminary trials in babies that had had HIE and, and cooling them. However, the medical community wasn't quite ready to get on board. And there were three main reasons why the medical community wasn't quite ready yet. The first argument, which is basically the argument in every single neonatal study, is that the sample sizes just weren't big enough. So this wasn't representative of every single neonate that might end up being cooled. The second argument to why we weren't ready to start cooling babies was that in some of the studies done, some of the babies in the placebo group, so the babies that didn't end up being cooled, developed hyperthermia. So they ended up with kind of low grade fevers, like 99 and 100 degrees. And it was argued that it's not so much that the cooling is helping the cooled group, but rather that the hypothermia babies were just going to do a lot worse because hypothermia is not good for a baby's brain. It increases the metabolic rate. Then people kind of analyzed the data further and came back and argued, well, really, even if what the cooling is doing is preventing the hypothermia, then this is still good for the babies. And thirdly, the last argument for why people weren't ready to start cooling was that they were concerned that even if it did improve neurological outcomes, it may also decrease the number of babies that died. And so there was some concern that there would be a whole group of babies that previously would have passed away, but now would have survived, but with profound neurodevelopmental disabilities. Finally, though, enough meta-analyses were done, and by about 2008, 
the cooling therapy became standard of care for babies with moderate to severe HIE. Initially, the therapy was only started in kind of research hospitals and academic hospitals. And so if a baby needed cooling and they were in like a community hospital, they would have to be transferred in. This was really not ideal, and we'll talk about that later, why that wasn't ideal. But now we're kind of in a situation where more and more even community hospitals are, are cooling infants. Now let's talk about how cooling therapy works. Like we discussed in that first video, the pathophysiology, it was found to really be the latency phase, that kind of phase when all the blood was rushing back to the brain that was causing the most damage to the brain. And it's been known for a long time that it's that latency phase that is the most amenable to treatment. Now, cooling is known to decrease many of those active processes that happen during that latency phase, even though if the exact mechanisms of how that happens are not known. So hypothermia reduces metabolic demand, so the cells just don't need as much energy. It decreases the number of oxygen free radicals that are floating around. It inhibits a lot of the apoptosis. It also decreases the overall inflammatory response. And therefore, with all these mechanisms, it decreases the amount of cell death. So even though the exact mechanism of action is not known in all these different scenarios, generally it's increasing all those excitatory pathways that would lead to cell death. Right, let's move on to number three. Which infants qualify for cooling? Like many of the older studies in the 1950s and 60s, it was shown that premature babies that do become hypothermic are at increased risk of dying. So in most hospital protocols, babies have to be at least 35 or 36 weeks to be cooled. Kind of the same thing with IUGR or SGA status. And again, most hospitals have protocols where babies have to be at least 1800 or 2000 grams, which is just over four pounds to be cooled. And then there are several contraindications to cooling. The first is if the baby has any severe life-threatening anomalies, heart or lungs, or any severe chromosomal disorders, then obviously these are not babies we'd want to cool. The second is if the baby has very severe pulmonary hypertension. So cooling itself can worsen pulmonary hypertension. So again, we wouldn't want to make the respiratory status significantly worse. The third is if the baby has a very severe bleeding issue. Again, cooling can affect the coagulation pathway as well as the function and number of platelets. And so we would not want to cool a baby unless that was under control. And the fourth contraindication would be that if the baby's HIE was so severe that, and the baby was so sick, needing presses and high support and really not doing anything, that at that point any therapy would be considered futile. And then the final contraindication, for now at least, is if the baby is more than six hours old. So it's been shown that if the babies are more than six hours old, then cooling therapy doesn't really help as much, which is very consistent with having to catch that latency phase during the pathophysiology, like we talked about. There are a lot of studies being done as to whether there would be any benefit if we start cooling, but for now, an infant has to be less than six hours old to qualify for cooling therapy. Then, like we talked about in the previous video, you need the history and the physical exam consistent with HIE. One, you need a history of an acute perinatal event, so a cord compression or a uterine rupture or an abruption or something that happened perinatally that would suggest severe hypoxia or ischemia to the baby. Two, an ABCAR score of less or equal to five at 10 minutes, or still needing active resuscitation, so positive pressure ventilation, cardiac compressions, or cardiac meds at 10 minutes. And three, a cord pH of less than seven, or the initial pH of less than seven on the baby's gas, and a base deficit of more or equal to minus 16. So I do just want to say at this point that in many hospital protocols, you don't have to have the presence of all of these three to cool a baby. So for example, if you had a pH of 7.02 or a base excess of minus 13 with a neurologically affected baby that would be considered moderate HIE, then that is a baby that you should probably end up cooling. And then obviously to cool, you have to have evidence of moderate to severe HIE 
on the physical exam. And again, this is consistent with the modified SANAT scoring. Please go back and look at the previous lecture so that you have a good idea of what those different stages would look like. If a baby has seizures, then remember, then that baby automatically has at least moderate HIE. I do want to make a point here though, that very often seizures won't start until 12 or 24 hours of life, or at least beyond that first six hours that you have to make a decision about cooling a baby or not. So again, if a baby is borderline, you're not quite sure if they're mild to moderate HIE, but they do fulfill all the other criteria, the cord gases and the pH and the, the base deficit and everything, then if anything, you should probably hedge on cooling that baby. Not that we ever want to give treatments to babies that don't need it, but if the baby is seizing, then you've already missed that window. Now let's go over the treatment itself. So as we've already said multiple times, the cooling therapy needs to be initiated within six hours of life. Infants need to be cooled to 33.5 degrees Celsius for the cooling therapy. So plus or minus 0.5 degrees Celsius. So somewhere between 33 and 34 degrees. There are two main technologies to do this. One of them is the cool cap, where just the cooling device is put on the baby's head, and the other is the whole body cooling, where the baby lays on a blanket. Both of them use similar technology, which is that there's water rushing through the machines that will either be different temperatures cooled or heated to different temperatures so that it's constantly supplying the correct temperature to the baby. So the machines are constantly getting feedback from the baby's temperature using a core thermometer and then supplying the amount of heat or coolness that the baby needs to keep that baby at about 33.5 degrees. We mostly use the whole body cooling now just because with that, the baby's head is more accessible to the continuous AEG monitoring if that's what we choose to do. Usually the baby's core temperature is measured using an esophageal probe. So we put a thermometer down into the baby's esophagus and that's hooked up to the machine so it's constantly sending information back to the machine. Sometimes a rectal probe is also used. Infants are cooled for a total of 72 hours. Studies have shown that cooling babies beyond that hasn't really shown to be helpful. So they're cooled for a total of 72 hours and then they're warmed up pretty slowly back to their normal temperatures. So normally that takes an additional six hours of rewarming the infants. During this period of cooling, obviously the baby needs to be otherwise supported. The respiratory system needs to be supported. So the baby may need to be on a ventilator or an oscillator. He may need CPAP or just a nasal cannula. Remember that cooling itself can worsen pulmonary hypertension. So sometimes these babies might need inhaled nitric oxide. Remember though, cooling does not require a baby to be intubated. And if the baby looks like he's ready to be extubated or never needed to be intubated at all, then those babies can just be lying there on room air. The cardiac system may need to be supported. So if the baby is hypertensive, then you may need to start presses, dopamine or dobutamine. Remember as well that cooling in itself is going to lower the heart rate. It's going to cause sinus bradycardia. So a lot of these babies will have a heart rate in the 80s. A heart rate in the 80s in an otherwise well baby should provide sufficient cardiac output to satisfy the metabolic demands of the body. So we can accept a heart rate in the 80s. Neurologically, the baby needs to be supported as well. And during whole body cooling, we normally have continuous EEG monitoring on a baby's head. It is not as sophisticated as the regular EEGs that the neurologists do, but it will give us an idea if the baby is seizing. Obviously, we're also constantly examining the baby and making sure that they're not clinically seizing. Obviously, if the infant is seizing, then we should be starting anti-epileptic drugs, whether it's phenobarbital or Keppra or whatever your institution happens to use. These come with their own side effects and possible effects on developmental outcome, so we should not be starting anti-epileptic drugs prophylactically. We only start them if we actually know that the baby is having a seizure. If the babies are pretty awake when they're being cooled, so normally the moderate HIE, then just being that cold can make them really uncomfortable and then they get really agitated. Obviously, if they're agitated, then you're kind of not getting all the benefits of the cooling therapy. So we should give adequate sedation or pain medication to these babies. So we'll give morphine or fentanyl or another narcotic 
sometimes these don't work as well and we end up having to give a benzodiazepine like Versed. Just remember, when you are giving a benzodiazepine for the purposes of sedation or just calming the baby down, just remember that these can also prevent seizures. So you want to make sure that you are not masking the seizure in the baby and that you are adequately treating the possible seizure. From a hematological standpoint, cooling itself can affect both the platelet function as well as the platelet number, as well as throw off the whole coagulation pathway. So we need to be following those numbers, the PT, the PTT and CBCs, and if the baby has any bleeding, then the baby may end up needing transfusions. And then nutritionally, obviously we need to be supporting these babies. These are definitely babies that we do not want to be overloading with fluid. Remember, they're already at increased risk of cerebral edema. So if you're then giving them loads of fluid boluses or a very high daily volume of fluid, then they are going to be at increased risk of having worsening cerebral edema. On top of that, because the babies took a hit to their brain, they are also at increased risk of developing SIADH, or syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, antidiuretic hormone secretion. So these are babies that just kind of stop peeing because of a hormonal standpoint. Same thing with the kidneys, because the kidneys also took a hit, then the creatinine will probably also go up and they're going to pee a lot less. So these are babies that can get fluid overloaded very, very easily, and you definitely don't want to give them a lot of fluid. So really maximum, you should be putting a term baby on up to about 60 milliliters per kilo per day, maybe even less than that, and use fluid boluses very sparingly. Ideally, these infants have central lines, so preferably a UAC and a UVC, and you can start total parenteral nutrition or TPN through them. So you can provide all the proteins and fat and sugar and vitamins and minerals that babies need directly into their blood. More recently, it has been shown that these babies can tolerate small amounts of feeds and it's helpful for them in the future, kind of starts building up their gut and they're more likely to tolerate feeds better after they're warmed up. So you can pretty much start up to about 20 mLs per kilo per day, so really trophic feeds, preferably breast milk, and obviously it's all going to be gavage fed. And then finally, because of all the potential issues that you're going to have with the electrolytes, as well as really all the labs, the LFTs, the sodium, the acidosis, the platelets, the WBC count, lots and lots of things can go abnormal. So you should be monitoring all the lab counts often, which is why it's so helpful to have a arterial access. Finally, let's talk about outcomes after cooling or after HIE. Like a lot of neonatology, the best predictor of developmental outcome in the future is the physical exam pretty much at the time of discharge. So if a baby after he's been cooled is going home with a normal neurological exam on full PO feed, so eating fully with a bottle, then there's an excellent chance of a normal neurological outcome. Most centers will get an MRI after the baby has rewarmed, so somewhere between day of life 4 to day of life 14 at two weeks of life. The presence of any ischemic injuries on the MRI will lend itself to a worse prognosis. So whether those ischemic injuries are on are in the cerebral cortex, in the posterior capsule, or really badly in the basal ganglia, any injuries will increase the chance of having worse ne neurodevelopmental sequelae. As you can imagine, the worse the HIE, the higher the chance of having developmental sequelae. So if you are a baby that had mild HIE, then most likely the developmental outcomes are going to be completely normal. Infants with moderate HIE have about a 25 to 30% chance of having later sequelae. So it could be something really mild like ADHD or some mild learning disabilities, or it could be more severe, so CP or seizure disorders in the future. Again though, if the neurological exam is normal at discharge and the MRI is normal, then the chance of a completely normal development is extremely high. Before cooling was initiated as a therapy, about 75% of infants with severe HIE died. Now, those numbers are much lower, but their chance of having some effect on their developmental outcomes is still pretty high. So, 
that's all I have about cooling therapy for now. If you do have more questions on this absolutely fascinating topic, then please mention them below. Otherwise, please remember to like and subscribe and let me know any other topics that you'd like me to talk about. Thank you so much for being here.